So one of the major jobs in our field is actually working in a mental facility or a mental hospital or a mental wellness hospital or a psychiatric ward or whatever kind of uh, words we put to it. And it's a very different sort of job. And whenever I talk with people who have jobs like this or or who have had jobs like this, I always find it fascinating because the the sort of work can have a lot of different facets to it. You could be working as a counselor, like a regular therapist doing talk therapy with someone. You could be doing group therapy. You could also be wrestling with a patient because they have attacked you or they are attacking someone else. Or you might be trying to save someone from harming themselves. Or you might be, I don't know, dealing with bodily fluids that they're flinging at you or something. And and it's all just part of the job. And people who work in these jobs in these facilities are a, a, a certain kind of saint because they, they can put up with it. Well, I was talking with Michael Drain, who is the host of the Unpopular Culture podcast, whom you all know because he's been on the podcast before. And we were talking and we were thinking, I was thinking that... I would love him to come on the podcast to talk about his experience because he, you've worked, you worked at a facility for nine years. Is that what you said? I worked in several different facilities over the course of about nine years in so, Ar- in Arizona. In Arizona, yeah. And so I thought I would just have him on the show and ask him what it was like. So welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, sir. This is the Psychology in, in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Doctor Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Michael? My name is Michael Drain. I'm the host of Unpopular Culture. I'm also a therapist and soon to be professor, which is really exciting. Cool. Yeah. So what was it like to work in one of these facilities? Well, so let me take you back on the trip. The year is 2008, and I am just a young, green little man trying to break into the behavioral health system. The behavioral health system is very nebulous. It's Do you very, have a master's at this point? Oh, no. No, no, no. I don't even... <clears throat> I have like some community college credits under my belt at this point. I just know that I want to... I had a boxing coach that got me into it, actually. He worked for a group home uh, that had three uh, three people inside of it. One had a severe eating disorder, mild uh, uh, developmental delay, um, and some light uh, auditory command hallucinations. He would see things. He would talk to people, that sort of thing. Um, and then another, another one that was very, uh, severely delayed nonverbal. And then another one that was very highly autistic, also nonverbal and, uh, had a lot of behavioral cues and would sort of be, uh, very meticulous about things being moved. And when they weren't, he would, they would sort of pop off. So that was my first behavioral health job with no prior experience about what any of that meant or what to do or what these diagnoses are or what I'm looking at. It was very, and, and it's not like they give you much of an education. These are, these group homes are not well-funded. They don't pay you super well. Um, and you just don't get the proper training to know how to deal with like, like they'll give you, um, you know, physical defensive stance. And, you know, if you get attacked, you know, here's what you do. You raise your arms a certain way and you... Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's what, a, a certain way for what? Well, it'd be hard to describe over a podcast, but like f- like one move, for example, is if a if a patient is trying to pummel you, like like imagine me standing over you and I'm just beating you with my my fists, bam, 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 bam. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to beat your head and your chest and stuff. Well, something you can do, what they teach you to do, is kind of cross your arms in front of yourself to make sort of a shield. And as you do that, you're supposed to back away slowly, back away slowly. And it's it's about like being non-aggressive. But they also teach you restraints and stuff, these really advanced holds, depending on if it's just one of you or two of you or three of you or how big the patient is, if it's a child, if they're older, there's all these different techniques for how to take them down in a, in a safe way way but you know it doesn't always happen that way because the reality is you know people are flying around all over the place and you're trying not to hurt anybody but people get hurt sometimes just in the the squabble of it all so you were a uh, you didn't have much 
college education and you started working in one of these places? Yep. Yeah. It as was a, as a what? Uh, a behavioral health tech, I guess okay. you could say. And your job is to do what? My job at that place, at the, it's an entry level job. My job was basically to supervise the people in the house. They had 24 hour staff. So my shifts would be 16 hours or, you know, uh, eight hours or whatever. And, um, if it was a night shift, I would sleep there. I would just kind of, you know, like stay on the couch and, and, uh, like make sure they were okay. Um, and any, how many, how many patients in that house? There were three. And do you have just regular clothes or do you have like a white lab coat? No, you just wear like regular clothes. In fact, they kind of frown on you coming in looking, you know, scrubs and all that. They, they're trying to create a home environment and sort of normalize these people's lives as much as possible. So three patients who are there involuntarily. Um, I suppose you could frame it that way. They're, Can they leave? Uh, no. I, I mean, no. I mean, general, I'm speaking generally, but it depends on how f- high functioning they are and what kind of uh, uh, independencies they have worked out with their particular court situation. So, but those three, uh, no, they were, they were not their own legal guardians. So it meant that if one of them went wandering down the street and disappeared, they don't have the right to do that because their dad is the legal guardian and can say, my son is disabled. He's, he's not able to take care of himself. He can call the police and the police will kind of find them hopefully and bring them back home. So they are adults who have uh, been determined legally not to be able to be in control of their own lives. And they, instead of living at home with their families or in a some other kind of voluntary independent living program or something, they come to your facility because they've hurt someone or hurt someone else or what's, what's the problem or their, their family doesn't think that they're, I mean, sadly, sometimes it is honestly that their family does not want to take care of them. They're, they're high needs. There's a lot that goes in. There's a lot of behaviors to manage. Um, one patient I'm thinking an example, he would, he had a severe binge eating disorder, but he was also mildly re- retarded. He was developmentally delayed, so he didn't have a lot of capacity to like redirect. So every night it was a struggle where you would like, if you didn't catch him, he would be eating like raw bacon out of the out of the freezer, you know, which can be bad for you. Yeah. Um, but imagine a, a parent or a, you know, you you got a a lot of these families have other kids at home. They have their careers, you know, they're middle income people just trying to get by. And then they have this son that is extremely high demanding. They're autistic or whatever, and they can't really handle it. Or they're all the way that all the way down to the fact that they might be just shitty parents and don't want to handle it. But I've seen, I've seen both. I've seen parents that are extremely involved. They, they put them in these home environments because there's 24 hour staff that's going to make sure that they're safe. They're going to keep them in line of sight. They're going to give them medications when they need it. You know, they'll get their, their antipsychotic meds every three times a day or whatever it is. And they're safe and it's a home environment. Everybody's wearing normal clothes in a normal house for the most part. And it's sort of like a, you know, like a roommate situation. Um, they watch TV, they yep. yeah. TV, e- exercise, yeah. they go on trips and stuff. I yeah, guess. yeah. Although, um, the so the idea is, uh, the one I worked in Arizona at first, the idea was that they would have a budget allotted to them and they could do basically whatever they wanted with this budget. They could take their money and, and uh, we had a van where we could take them to go spend that money any way they saw fit. They could see a movie. They could get a drink at the food court. They could do whatever they wanted. And the idea was the idea behind that, that slush money is to give them, you know, the, the ability to kind of get out of that house and do something with their lives and give them hope and stuff. They also help them with jobs and stuff, too. Yeah, I had a job. I, when you were talking about working in these kinds of jobs, I... I didn't realize you were talking about this sort of work because, uh, uh, because correct me if I'm wrong. Have you worked in an actual hospital as well? With yeah, I've worked yeah. in several hospitals. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'd be interested in that too, obviously. But I had a job that was exactly like this, except that it was for teenagers, and same deal, like three to five and uh, teenagers in this house up in Everett, and there would be about. I don't know, two or three staff at any given time. And same deal. Um, yeah. pe- kids, well, different kind of route to for the kids, for the teenagers to be there. None of them were developmentally disabled, Smart. or that, at least that wasn't the significant 
issue. More it like was conduct disorder. And yeah, that. it was running away from home. Yeah. It was, um, it was beating your parents. It was, um, uh, just really dangerous, deemed by somebody. You know? Yeah. And I don't remember who paid for it though. I th- I think, I think the families might have paid for it if I'm not mistaken. So anyway, and that was you know. I'm guessing really similar to what you're talking Sounds about. Sounds like it. Yeah. I had a job more like what you're talking about where they're, they're high functioning. The the issue is more like conduct disorder. I'm air quoting because that's a hugely over blanketed diagnosis. But, but uh, you know, uh, common vernacular might frame them as like the kids that don't straighten up and fly right. You know, smoking dope, ditching school, that, that sort of thing. And, and obviously it's not as simple as they're doing those things. There's underlining issues going on. But, but just to like you know, paint a picture for the kind of person. It's not that they're psychotic. It's not that they're developmentally delayed necessarily. Although a lot of them have been through trauma. I've worked in places like that too. And I remember first when I worked at one of those with when it was high functioning teenagers in sort of a group home foster care sort of situation, the two things I noticed was that in this one house, and this was a Phoenix house. So it's like several bedrooms and stuff. But even despite all that, uh, you had each room had, I don't know, three or six beds crammed inside of it, like a bunk bed sort of situation. There must have been 20 kids in that one house. So it's it's sort of like a like a cattle farm or something. You know, they're just, they're, it just you know, and when you have that much to, to look after and you have like two or three staff, I mean, what's the quality that each of these kids are actually getting given their some of their trauma? There was a kid that was very sexually abused and a kid that had a lot of trauma and any loud noise or something would sort of trigger him. And then that was a whole thing that one staff member would then have to deal with. Yeah. But then you got all the inner workings of just teenagers being teenagers and the socializations that just naturally happen, right? So you also have the the bullying and the clicking up and the groups and the girls versus the boys. And Did anything sort of bad happen, like assaults or sexual assaults? Well, <clears throat> not, you- not the place I'm thinking of, but at the hospital I worked at, the hospitals are where the stories get more intense. Okay. Before going on to that, yeah. I'll just tell my my little story that I've told on the podcast before, I think, is that so I was, I think it was like I was about to get my master's. I was about to enter graduate school and I uh, used to work in business and decided that I wanted to work in psychology and I was just looking for any kind of job in psychology and this was one of the jobs that they had. By the way, have you seen Short Term 12, the movie Short Term 12? No. Uh-huh. It's a movie about a group home for teenagers. You should see it to oh, see. Wow. And it's it's really good. And uh, Is it authentic? Did you verify it for authenticity? Yeah, it's <laughs> one of the most authentic movies about that or the most. And huh you know, therefore no one wanted to watch it. You right. Know what I mean? Cause it's actually horribly. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the workers who were in charge of the kids, the main character, she suffered from her own traumas, you know? And so that's part of the story as well. But yeah, they do one of the therapeutic holds and And I remember learning therapeutic holds and I actually used a therapeutic hold once on a five-year-old who was trying to attack me. Wow. It was really easy to do, but, sure. uh, but anyway, but at that age, you have to be careful if that five-year-old has sexual abuse or history of it. You, you, even you, you're in this precarious, impossible sort of situation where the kid's acting out, he's hurting himself or somebody else. You have to do something. But by putting hands on him, you are, you might be re-triggering him. Well, whatever any, he's any, been through. any age would, would have a problem with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm yeah, just, yeah. but you know, I think a five-year-old would be in particularly kind of confused about what's going on and not able to explain. And what do you think? I think people have to resort to, you know, what. Yeah. You got to do what to, you got to do. Yeah. And, and if someone, he was attacking me and. Right short of just running away, which right. wasn't really an option for me in the moment. Uh, right. That was all I had. That's all I could do. Of course. It, it was really hard, though, because the therapeutic holds are sort of designed for people your own size, or at least relatively. Right. And, you know, because I, I did the hold where I crossed his arms and got behind yeah. him. and Sat uh, down. Yeah. yeah. And, but you're supposed to get real low so they can't headbutt you, you know? Yeah, you keep your head off to the side. But imagine getting your head off to the side of a person who's like three feet tall. Like, it's hard. To, anyway, the point is, is that when I was at the group home for the teenagers, 
I was planning on becoming a therapist, but I wasn't in graduate school yet, or I was right in the beginning, I think. And I was tasked with, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what exactly I was supposed to do, but it was somehow like getting through to the three girls who were living in this house, you know, somehow just like trying to make them not so angry and, 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 and pissed off and tense all the time. And so I think I was trying to like, it's quite a task. <laughs> yeah. But that were, that was really everyone's task yeah. was like, you know, try to reach out and help them to get along and feel comfortable and not be so pissed off and conduct disorder e all the time. And so I was trying to reach out and I was like, you know, didn't know what to do and really nervous about it. And this one girl knew or probably detected that I had somehow let my guard down and was really trying to do something. And she just went off on me. Like she, she knew exactly what to say to hurt my feelings. You know, I can't, I don't know what she said, but it was, it was some kind of barrage of, of very poignant insults to me. And I actually started to cry. Oh, dude. And, um, well, I don't know if I cried in the moment. I might've cried later. All I know is I cried and, and it was, it was very hurtful, you know, cause right. I, I would, cause in my mind, I'm like, I'm here to help. And right. I, don't, I don't have any, anything bad. I don't have any bad thoughts about you. I don't right. have any wishes of ill will to you. And I'm getting paid like a minimum wage. Yeah, and, right. And like, <laughs> can't we, can't you just like, at the very least, just ignore me? Like, <laughs> like you don't have to go along with what I'm saying, but you don't have to, you don't have to be so mean, you know, like I, what did I ever do to you? And it, it was so um, horrible, I right. guess, that I, I remember looking back at that moment and it broke me basically in a good way, you know, that you have to go through something like that, I think, in order to realize that when people attack you like that, it's not personal. And Two, that you should never open up your heart to people who can hurt you like that at work. You know, like these are people who have been through a lot and are trying to protect themselves or are literally sadistic and take pleasure in harming other people. Yeah. And you just can't go to work and like open and put your heart on your sleeve because you're, you'll be dead. Yeah, you're not going to last long. That's yeah. for damn sure. Yeah. And so from that point forward, even though I cared about my clients and people I worked with, I never like just completely laid myself bare the way I did to them. What we're describing is that ther what do you call it? But the, the therapeutic wall, the ability to sort of like hold empathy for your client, but without taking it in too much. You know, there's there's a sort of this type. Well, sometimes rope. people call it a frame, but um, but yeah, I mean it's weird because on some level it's like. I don't have, so I, I consider it two different things now that I think about it. One is, is I can give someone a ton of empathy, yeah. you know, and I can give someone a ton of care. I can really listen to them. I can really care about them. But my ego is not on the line. Do you know what I mean? Like with this girl, my ego was on the line. Like Why? I, I, what? Why was, she, why was your ego on the line with Because this I didn't know the difference between having empathy and caring and trying to help someone without being personally involved. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, I didn't know I did I, cause when in my life would I have ever been that way? You yeah. know, when, when would you ever try to care deeply about someone or really try to reach out to someone without also being personally involved, you know, cause you're talking about relationships with family or friends or, you know, I don't know, other kinds of things. I never tried to reach out to someone in a professional manner, you know? And so it was after that point where I began the journey of learning how to be empathetic and caring and reaching out and being relational and being present and being real. But at the same time, it's like, if you attack me, you're not really attacking me because I am not, my, my whole personhood is not here for you to attack. Right. You know, like I, I'm a, I'm your professional helper. I am not your spouse or your brother or your friend or your son or your uncle. You know, I am, I'm your therapist. And you, if you start attacking me, I, I can't say it's not going to bother me, but 
I, I'm ready for it, you know, right. in the way that I was not ready for it with, with this first person. Well, you, you didn't have the clinical skills at that point to, to understand, you know, oh, yeah. the things we're talking about. Like to, to know that the, the, the name she's calling you are likely been internalized in her from whatever shit she's been through. And totally. It has nothing to do with Totally. You. That helps. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah but yeah. but you it, so you lack that sort of perspective. You, when you, as a therapist, you know, you have a framework of what their, their pathology is, their diagnosis, you know, what they, their behaviors are, you understand why they happen. And, and you've been through training, which helps you to sort of keep an emotional distance from it and see the situation as a matter of symptomology. She's not mad at me. She's not yelling at me. This is a behavior she's expressing right now. This has nothing to do with me, but they don't teach you that no. at that level. You don't actually get any of that experience. No. And this is, I think this is a, a, a high potential for burnout with therapists because they either give it all, they put all their heart out on their sleeve and in po difficult populations like that, I mean, in general population, I imagine you could get hurt doing that eventually anyway, but with, with this kind of population, you put it all out there, you're going to get hurt like you did. But at the same time, if you wall up and hole up and you don't let anybody in and you don't give any empathy, you're not going to be an effective therapist that way either. You have to find the sweet spot. And the way that you did it and the way that I did it was almost um, like I described it as baptism by fire, you know, going in there with very little training, very little support or expertise, not getting paid very well and dealing with the most difficult population that there is, you know. So it, it, if you can survive it without quitting and walking away and being like, this profession is not for me, you know, and I got there a couple times, to be honest, until I got into private practice and, and realized, okay, I just, I just need to shift into something else. I've, cause nine years, when I told you I've been doing that for nine years, your, your jaw dropped, like how the hell did, did you survive that? Yeah. Yeah, because I you had said you had done it before, and I was thinking um, a year, you know, maybe two, but nine years, yeah, because it it is a relatively thankless job. Yep, um, it's relatively low paying, mm -hmm. and you can be physically harmed, yes, and traumatized, and and the patients don't necessarily get any better, right? So you're not seeing. Uh, progress. So right. it's, it's, you're basically trying to help people to stay alive and maintain. Right. And, and you're just, I don't know. I, I, I found the work to be, and the other thing is there's certain, you know, one thing they don't talk about when they're doing like career day <laughs> is like what actually working at a job is like. Yeah. Like you describe these jobs and you're just like, Oh, that sounds fun. But when you actually do jobs, different jobs, you realize, Oh, some jobs are have extremely different vibes to them, you know? Like after I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I got a job doing, um, I had various different jobs, but one of the jobs that I had was working as a research administrator at a hospital. And I realized that having an office and having a job that you had, uh, basically you had tasks that you did you know, like the, the administrators would give me a task. They'd be like, okay, we need you to research this thing about the hospital, do it in this relative amount of time and present a report to us in roughly this amount of time. Yeah. And so, so I would go to, I would wake up whenever I wanted to, I'd go into work whenever I want to. I love it already. I, I would go to this office. No one was monitoring me. Yeah. I would play video games part of the time. <laughs> Back then it was uh, an early version of Civilization. I think it was Civilization 2 at the time. Oh, I love that game. Yeah. Um, and I would take long lunches and I would leave early, but I got the job done, you yeah. know, and everyone was happy. And, uh, and I, but no one would, I know, you know, I never would have said like, oh, I want to be a hospital research administrator. Uh, that's what I want to do with my life. Yeah. But when you think about the actual job, whereas down the hall, there was this sort of bullpen of other administrators that all worked in this cubicle situation and had to act like they were working all the time, you know, Ugh, what kind and, of fresh hell is that? Right. So, so there's all these different kinds of jobs. And one of the things about this job is you know, correct me if I'm wrong, or at least the context I worked in is you were always working. Like you walked into that, to that facility. And yeah. You could take breaks, but, um, but you, you couldn't just like veg out in front of a computer for a couple hours and shop on Amazon. Like 
you had to be watching them physically or and or there would be some kind of major demand that would pull you into an actual situation, you know, like you had to be vigilant the whole time. And that can really drag someone down, right? Especially after 16 hours. Right. And and that's the other thing of just <laughs> of any job that should be less than eight hour shifts, <laughs> they go to 16. That, that always just boggles me, you know, accountants don't pull 16 hour shifts. Yeah, you know what I, I mean? I always actually like the three 12 hour shifts because I had four days off and, you know, you kind of get a tolerance for it. It's all a preference. 12 but. I can get, but 16 just, it sounds not good for anybody. I did that. Yeah. I did two 16s and then uh, back. I mean, to unless, back. unless some of it is sleeping, which is, which is probably different, right? No, no. So not including sleeping. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was a kind of a stupid move on retrospect, but, um, at the time, it felt nice because it was like, oh, I can work for two days and then I'm off for the rest of the week. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, if, if people are cool with it. but It's a balance. But because what I found out is that was too much because that, that those two days it zapped me out so bad right. that I spent that whole five days recovering right. and I needed more of a work-life balance and that was not the direction. Right. Exactly. So I found like three twelves. Even in my private practice, I try to frame all my patients within you know, three, maybe four days if I can. I mean, I'm also in school and do a podcast and all this other stuff. But for me, it's just easier to kind of bracket it into one part of my week. You know, totally, totally. Well, let's take a break and we get back. Let's hear your horror stories. What do you say? Let's do it. Okay, so we're back from the break. So Michael Drain from Unpopular Culture Podcast. Tell me about some horror stories some war stories from working in some of these facilities what's what what's some of the like well let me just ask you some questions have you ever been punched (laughs) yeah i've been punched i've been bitten i've been kicked i've been thrown to the ground one let me just summarize in a in a short story the amount of danger and violence and and were all these consensual or non-consensual what do you mean did you consent to being punched? Kicked? No, no, I did not consent to being okay. punched. No, no. I, don't, I don't know what you're into. No. So. <laughs> well, yeah, that's my that's my other life when I dress up as Batman. The, the uh, uh, I wa- so I was wandering through the uh, Arizona State Forensic Hospital on my break. I'm a tech, and it's basically the same kind of job. Um, it's so this is a hospital hospital with hallways and beds and. Lots of different patients and actual psychiatrists roaming around and, right. um, and long-term patients that probably are convicted of some kind of uh, crime and have to go to a hospital for a set amount of time. Correct. Okay. So basically, you have three, on this campus, you have three campuses in one. One is a civil hospital where they're just so mentally ill they cannot, they're just chronically schizophrenic and cannot take care of themselves. And they have no family and very few resources. And they've just kind of fallen into the system. And they're, they're, they've been there for 30 years and they're probably going to stay there, you know, until the end of their life. I don't know. I don't want that to happen. But we just simply don't have the ability. Well, let me ask you if they weren't there, wouldn't they just be on the street? Exactly. Right. So, so they're, I'm not saying that they're, they're not better off. I just, it's just horribly sad to see somebody in a, a mental hospital with no real uh, hope in sight that, that, you know, and a lot of the, when I had patients like that, it was about managing very small expectations. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's a civil hospital. They didn't do anything wrong. They're just, they're just very unsafe to themselves or somebody else because they're that mentally ill. And then you have the sex offender hospital, people who, this is uh, all the same facility? Yeah, same. it's all within one campus. There's three hospitals on this one campus. In Phoenix. In Phoenix. With lots of air conditioning. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of air conditioning. Yes, that's right. Because in my mind, I'm like, you, you add 110 degree weather to that <laughs> to that soup. Right, right. Not, not a good situation. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, and, and tempers fly, and no doubt about it. So the... The sex offender hospital, I had a few patients on there. Um, my experience with it was that they, um, various reasons why they got there, but in general, they usually are were um, found guilty of some kind of sex sex crime. And you can, I mean, anything from rape to, you know, uh, public urination near a grade school and everything in between, you know, things that would consider be considered low 
versus things that are highly assaultive and inappropriate to other people, mm. you know, um, with kids and just all kinds of stuff. A lot of the therapists wouldn't work over there. They had a really hard time working with that population. My mindset at the time was all about absorbing all that is the human mind and all these different experiences. And I just had this mind of like a researcher. And, and so um, I was able to kind of keep a wall there and, and, and work with that. And then the forensic hospital is where I spent the most time. Those people uh, are, they're guilty of, they were found guilty, uh, but they were also found, so it's called guilty except insane. It's like the insanity plea that common vernacular would have you say. And um, they're serving a sentence for murder or assault or any any kind of thing. Um, and they're serving it in a mental hospital where it's a lockdown facility. They can't leave. They're in a day room. They got their room. They have, they're not allowed to have things like strings or shoelaces or cords or sharp objects. Um, you know, a lot of basic freedoms just kind of stripped away off the bat. Um, and P and the, the, the thing I always hear that I've covered on my show a couple of times is this, this idea that like with the slender man case, the two little girls went into a mental hospital and the backlash from the public was that, Oh, they're getting it off scot scot free. They're going to, you know, they should be in jail, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, I, the idea I think they have is that if they're in prison, then they're really getting the punishment they deserve. Right. Cause prison, prison is more harsh, but I'm here to tell you, number one, prison is more harsh. True but not but not a day spa either <laughs> and uh, i mean if you get out of line a bunch of orderlies can come attack you attack you and pump put you on the ground and stick you with thorazine until you know to to make you well and in a mental hospital for convicted criminals right. serving sentences it is a prison it's sure. just a prison designed for people who have mental conditions that uh, need to be treated exactly so, you know, so uh, whereas uh, in prisons plenty of people are in there with with uh, viable diagnoses that aren't being treated at all for sure and really no one wins in a situation like that right. so i mean obviously the the prisoner but the people around them their recovery their recidivism their chance of um i don't know building a successful life without having to turn to crime right so uh, mental hospital. They should really call them like uh, prisons with a psychiatrist or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead of like uh, they get to go to a mental hospital, right? Because you think hospital, you think nice beds and yeah, and like visitors and a big wi of. big windows and you know. And it's like no, yeah. The yeah. windows are so such a hardcore plexiglass. I saw a patient try to throw a very heavy chair through one of the nurse and it didn't crack. Yeah. And the other thing that can actually be much worse about a mental quote unquote mental hospital from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, Drain, is that when you are convicted to say 10 years, five with good behavior mm -hmm. in a, for, in a regular prison sentence, you serve that time and you get out. Right. Whereas when you are insane at the time of the crime, and are deemed uh, dangerous because of your quote unquote insanity, you go to these hospitals for an indeterminate amount of time. The psychiatrist at some, or the assessor of some sort will have to determine when you are ready to go. And so imagine you're that, you're that professional. You're sitting there look, trying to assess someone and you have to sign off that this person is ready to go out into the world and and you believe, you are endorsing that they aren't going to harm anybody. Right. And with all the psychopaths and people who know how to manipulate people, who you know, this is a known thing, particularly yep. in these kinds of facilities. Right. Um, how would you know the difference between someone who was legitimately recovered from their quote-unquote mental condition and someone who was just tricking you? It'd be really hard to tell. It's a tr Even to somebody like me who, I, I mean, I, I of all clinicians, I think I'm particularly, like, that's, that's my wheelhouse more than most people I come across. I sat in front of more sociopaths than I can count. But would you be willing to sign a document saying, yes, I would, I will allow this person to be free uh, to, you know, just wander the 
the planet and do whatever they want. You know no, what I mean? No, I mean yeah. no. If it if it were entirely Particularly given that they, they got in here because they killed five people over a five year period of exactly. time. Exactly, you know I mean? and and I'll do you one better because I I can I'm thinking of a client that I was working with and he was when they when they I first picked him up he had like three months left to be released. And we were doing, talking about transitioning. Were planning. you a master's level person at this point? I was an intern going through my master's. Okay. So baby baby clinician, you know. You chose to intern at one of these hospitals? Yeah. One of my first patients was to restore a guy to competency after he murdered his mother. I mean, I just wanted to drill on that just for a second. Yeah. Like, So you, 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 you're you working in these hospitals, and at some point you're like, I want to become a licensed counselor in Arizona. And so you go into a master's in counseling program. And where was it at? Oh, the the school is at, uh, in Colorado, Adams State. Oh, okay, and was it online or not entirely? The the some of the coursework was online, but then I would go out there for oh, intensives. Okay. So you're in Arizona, and then you're like, okay, I can intern anywhere. How about a, a hospital? Like like that's that you wanted to do that, right? Oh, okay, I did. I I was fascinated with criminal behavior and that sort of thing, antisocial narcissism. I mean, look at unpopular culture. I mean, it, it sh- you can see the interests that I have. They shine through very much so on the episode. Interesting. Okay, so back to your story. So back to my story. I, um, Yeah, one of my first people, I was in charge with barely knowing anything. I had to restore this guy to return to competency um, so that he could stand trial for his murder. Pretty big task for a brand new intern, right? I mean, so, I had a supervisor and everything. Right, but. So, so he's been... Uh, caught and they're building a case against him uh, t- and the prosecution is building a case, the defense is building their case and you are t- tasked with bringing him, bringing him to competency which is so that he knows what is happening in, in court so that he can uh, make decisions about, about plea deals and, and other kinds of things that he might have to do during the case because the state always wants that. They always want the the convicted or the accused to know what's happening because right. sometimes they don't. Sometimes the accused will be going through a trial and they'll just be like, they'll have no idea why they're even there. Right, and the layman might not know what's going on when they're or that they're just answering questions because they think they're supposed to or because they're right. they're manipulating. Right, you need a professional to go in and assess in a one-on-one level way before it gets to the courtroom. They want- and then you sign off something that the court sees saying that this professional is signing off that this person is competent to stand trial. Well, it, it's actually not that black and white. The assessments that I did, it's not like, yes, they're competent or no, they're not competent. It's a, it's a, it's a layer of grids. So like, uh, like you assess their orientation. Do they, are they aware of what time it is? Do they know who they are? Do they know who I am? Do they know what they're doing here? Do they know where they're here, why they're here? And so if someone's symptomatically schizophrenic, they're not going to know any of those things. Right. Um, or severely developmentally disabled, right. they might also not know. Right. And, and you have some people who are trying to trick you because... Right. They believe that if they act crazy or disoriented, somehow that will help them to get a lesser sentence or to be in a facility that will be easier to escape from or yep. be more cush or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, these, so a lot of these hospitals have, uh, or these patients have been through the system their whole life. You know, if they have something as pervasive as antisocial personality, you know, it's been with them for a long time. They know the system. They've been in and out of hospitals. They know what to say. This was not this guy's first rodeo. He had already come in for, well, actually, this particular guy, I was restoring the competency because he stabbed his mom, a neighbor, and a, and a sister that was just trying to help him. And the mom was his biggest support. He was just in a psychotic episode. And apparently, he claims that when he came out of it, he was like, oh, my God, what have I done? And then they were like, okay, Michael Drain, here's a case. And we're, you got to get this guy to figure out like what he did and get him in a place as if possible. I mean, they don't put the expectation on you like you need to fix this guy. You know, it's it's more fluid than that. You can it's like um, it's like the Cans F assessments. It's like it's like you were a two and now you're a one like you, you in certain levels. So you, know? you were tasked with helping him to understand that he had a psychotic episode and stabbed people unfairly and help him determine and assess to see if he's even qualified to answer that on his own. If he's not, if he's only alert 
so there's four orientations to how alert and oriented you can be. Alert means I'm awake and I'm, I'm taking in stimulus, but then there's four axes to that. So I, I can be alert and oriented to time, person, place, or situation. And depending on the state, in, Wash, uh, in Arizona, um, you could be three of the four and still be considered competent to answer a question and, and speak on your own behalf. If the clinician has made a good, uh, two sometimes, if the clinician has made a strong case for that, there could be special circumstances why they don't um, know where they are right in the moment, you know, memory issues and things like that. Sure. So, so what would they say if they were not oriented to situation? What kinds of responses would you get? So you would say, you know, I try to be casual about it because the, the asking them directly uh, t- tends to put them on guard. A lot of them are institutionalized and they know what you're saying anyway. Um, but I'll try to work it into a conversation. And I'll be like, so I'll ask them a question like, so how long have you been here? Do you wear a lab coat at this kind of job? I wear scrubs, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is like a hospital hospital. So um, how long have you been here? And just see, just see what they say. What is, what is their interpretation of what that question means? Mm-hmm. And stuff like that will open up to a bigger conversation about, you know, um, where, where are we right now? I haven't been in this part of the building. So if someone was not oriented, they might say something like... It's 1972. Yeah. Or I'm in my... Or they'll say, like, I'm in my head. Or one guy thought he could plug himself into the Matrix. So he would say, I'm in the Matrix. Right. You or know? I'm Jesus, or I'm the devil, mm-hmm. or I'm in hell, or I'm in heaven. Right. Or uh, this is a CIA facility. Right. Or whatever kind of delusion that they're involved in. Right. And once you hear, start hearing those those sort of delusional, paranoid kind of talk, you automatically know, okay, there's some psychosis going on here. But that's not to say just because they're psychotic doesn't mean they can't be oriented and speak for, the, for themselves. Mm. The courts care more about whether you're alert and oriented than they care about you having active psychosis. There's a lot of functioning schizophrenics, uh, schizophrenics that have they can walk through the world and sort of carry their delusion, and then they found a way to kind of integrate it into their lives. Yeah, you that'd know? be a funny like cartoon, schizophrenics. <laughs> like, wasn't it animaniacs? We're schizophrenics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, right, because someone could say that, well. The CIA is out to get me, and they can read my mind. And then you're like, "Well, do you know why you're here?" And they'd be like, "Well, yeah, I, because I stabbed my mom and my sister and, mm-hmm. and the neighbor." And and you might ask, like, "Do you know why that was wrong?" And you'd be like, "Well, yeah, that's against the law, and it hurts people." But you know, yeah, the FBI is is listening to my thoughts, right? You know, like you can be delusional and still know what's happening. It's not like there's a black and white there, right? But you could also be delusional and say like, um, you know, so do you know why you're here? And you're like, well, I'm here because you're the devil and you have, you know, you're you're trying to read my mind. And you're like, well, do you know what what was the initial reason that the police came to your door and, and handcuffed you? You'd be like, well, no, I don't even, what do you mean? Like, what, what, police? Like, they, they might not even remember or have as they were going through that they were interpreting things in such a psychotic manner they they wouldn't have even knew known they were police or even known that they were stabbing people right you know it could have been such a frenzy or interpreted in such a way that there's no memory of it to access that's exactly right though and and uh so to highlight that point there i'm thinking of a patient i had who told me a story I when I asked him something about like why what brought you into the hospital he told me this whole story about how he had to defend his wife from people who were coming to get him and um I don't completely remember the context of the story but he was defending them and they came in and all these people started coming into the yard and he had to fight them off and 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 they got a, and they finally won and they dragged him here and I was like huh and so I read the police report and the guy was swinging a broom at all the cops in the front yard as they're trying to arrest him because he is breaking into this woman's house that he doesn't know but he thinks it's his wife and yeah. he's got a protector right you know what I mean so yeah. there it, that and that's why I'm fascinated with this kind of this this area of psychology it's just there's just no 
limit to the human imagination and the the, the psychos- psychosis is in my head it's sort of an extension it's like runaway imagination you know it's like a, i always think of like a child's imagination the kind of things that they think and say you know it may be as a defense mechanism you know they, they develop these these hallucinations and delusions as a way to protect themselves mm-hmm. you know like yeah. the, like the guy that retreats into their matrix because when he was in his matrix he got all the girls he got everybody liked them there were no problems it was just easy so it was it was a literal escape into away from everything. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's other theories that I've heard as well. It's not my area, but there's a neurological sort of physical mechanism that is another hypothesis. I don't know if you know about it, but I'm, I'm going to butcher it because it was a long time ago I heard it, but it was something along the lines of that there's there's many different brain processes that we that need to be functioning well enough for our brains to work properly. Mm -hmm. And when we, uh, so we have a, some kind of, some kind of function in our brain that is associated with probably particular neurons that uh, helps us to differentiate between reality and, and just a thought that emerges in our mind. Right. right? So, uh, and if you have damage or, genetic problem or some kind of trauma yeah or trauma that can create a dysfunction of that function then say the police are coming to your door it feels like devils coming to your door or it feels like nazis coming to your door or it feel it feels it feels a certain way but your brain normally will go well those are police officers and they're probably not going to hurt me because they have to work by the law. I'm scared. I'm terrified. But but I'm gonna I'm gonna work against that and say like, well, let's hold on. Let's reserve judgment. You know, every, I can trust the system. Like, we have all these different sort of thoughts going on in our mind, racing around. Well, if something's going wrong with some neurons, like your feeling starts to make up a story essentially and then that be, and then that becomes believed by the cognitive reality check part of your brain i'm sure i'm butchering it but it, that's essentially what i remember it, no it, that's yeah. right i mean think of, think about your amygdala being triggered and you have your fight or fight or freeze response being triggered and you have that because any of us would have that but now you have this voice in your head that's that's providing subtext to what's going on those like when you're triggered like that, your your brain is telling you, "I'm in danger. I'm in trouble." Right. So, it, for a person with, that's actively psychotic, they're they're in danger. They're in trouble, and it's because my voice has this answer. It's because these people are secret agents. They've been following me all week. They're coming here to steal my technology, or they're coming here to drink my blood, or I mean, you I mean, you name it. And then it was something else you said that made me think is. It could be that simple. The ability to, if you and I could sit here and role play in a in a fantasy game, we could play like Dungeons and Dragons or something, or we could engage in our imaginations. And if we were still kids, we could do it probably even more strongly and and more deeply. We could really emerge ourselves in that game, you know. And and then I think of a dream, another alternate world, another place where you go. But the the average human has the ability to somehow come back to an orientation of reality. And I think psychotics aren't something about it. They, they just can't do it. And I, I've, I've found in my own experience that a lot of these delusions seem to be serving some kind of need, some kind of protective factor, like the guy that goes into the matrix to hide. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. So horror stories, horror stories. When, when was the hardest you were punched in the face? Uh, okay, so I was on my break, and I was wandering through a corridor I had not been through for, before, and um, something about the layout of the hospital was really strange because I was going through all these back doors that, that looked, and each, each door, because it's such a hardcore lockdown place, it requires a card reader that I would hold, I, we all had around our necks, so you'd put the card reader, it'd go beep, and then you'd hear the maglock, and then you could open this big, heavy door. So it takes a few seconds to get from door to door, right? Mm. Also, you want to make sure that door closes behind you because patients can be sneaky. They'll hide behind the back of the door and then run in as you're closing the door. It used to happen all the time. So I'm walking through all these doors, 
and I'm just kind of killing time. I got a half hour on my break, and I accidentally stumble into this room. I open the door, and there is this guy standing there. He's clearly a patient. Um, he sort of he has sort of a Thorazine shuffle, uh, meaning uh, Thorazine's a, a sedative that they give to people usually when they're acting out or they have like you know dangerous behaviors. But the side effect is it makes them sort of like zombified. They they do this literal shuffle where they don't move their feet very fast. They're sort of dead in the eyes. They're very slow to react. So this guy, I just saw the back of his long hair in his orange scrubs, and he sort of like shuffles and slowly turns around to me, and I had just stood it's, there. It sounds like a horror movie. Yeah. I had stood there in the doorway, and I was like, I was thinking, oh, shit. I wandered into a seclusion room with a patient, and what I was in is a, there's a reason he's in there. That they put you in a seclusion room because you are at that moment you are extremely dangerous to yourself or somebody else. Shouldn't the door be labeled? That is correct. Yeah, it should be. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I was in a shower <laughs> locker room for staff one day, and then I or one second, and I walked through the door, and then bam, I'm in this weird, like back door into an isolate. It made no sense. So this guy turns around, and I'm just like, I'm kind of holding the door open a little bit, and I was like. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think I have the wrong room. And he goes, yeah, I think you do. And then he just attacks me. Oh, my God. And it's a scramble for my life. The lanyards that we wear with the with the, the card reader, they're, they're breakaway. It's meant so patients can't choke you with them. So they, they break off in the back. So it was nothing for him. to. And he knows that. He's an institutionalized patient. So he grabs it, swipes it off. It kind of falls to the floor. And now I'm screwed. Because if that heavy door that I open behind me closes, I'm trapped with this guy. Oh, there's, my God. Yeah, there's no. So he wants to trap you and kill you. I don't know. I, th I felt like I was fighting for my life. Yeah. It was New Year's Eve on 2000, 2014, I think it was. So uh, then what happened? So the door is swinging closed? Swinging closed. So I'm on my back. and he's This is like a, a Indiana Jones scene. Or it something. felt a little bit like it, yeah. I mean, it didn't feel like it at the time, but it, I was it, I was completely in fight for my life mode. I just need a pistol and a whip. Yeah. Um, so as the door behind me is like slowly closing, I'm using one arm to keep it open, like, pro like swing it back open. It closes again. I swing it back open. And with my other arm and the rest of me, I... I'm sort of fighting this guy off and trying. Why to are you just him. running through the door? Because he's on top of me. Or you're on the ground. Yeah, you're on the ground. Yeah, he he took me down. Oh, you didn't see it coming. He just went bam, took me out from under the legs, and now I'm on my back. And you're just trying to keep the door open. So I because he's ripped off my card reader. It's right. it's way over there. Yeah. If the door closes, we're locked in this thing together. Seems like you everyone should have some kind of alarm system. We usually have radios. But we, or just like some kind of button, emergency button, like on the top of your head that you can just press and like everyone comes running. The problem with that is you get, well, they've, they've tried that. They have little life alerts and stuff that, that people wear, or most of the techs have a radio. One unit for all the staff, you'll get two radios for this, for all the staff, which, you know. But what would you have radioed? Like, I'm somewhere and I don't know where. Right. It, well, that would have been, that would have been difficult. But I could have said, you know, they, you call a code, it's a code red, uh, um, Code something. Uh, what is wrong with me? I've been too. I've been out of this too long. Code punch in code the face. Code gray. It's called a code gray. Code punch in the face. Code punch in the face. It's called code gray where I'm from. It basically means there's a psychiatric crisis. Shit is going down. Somebody's being attacked. All staff, stop what you're doing and run to that place. And but how would they know where you were? They wouldn't have. Yeah. Because I didn't know where I was. Right. I mean, I had a general sense of what unit I was on, but I, I was, I was sort of exploring the hospital when I found this. So. That's why it was so important not to let that door shut. And I managed to kind of get him off me, grab the card reader and like s slam the door as he's as he's lunging at it and just kind of lock him in there and then just take like a breath like, oh, my God, did that really happen? You know, oh, uh, my God. Yeah. And so I got I, you know, I got some punches to the face and the ribs and whatever. And I used to be a boxer. I don't really care about that. But but it was intense. It was scary, you know, because yeah, because yeah. I really felt like this guy would kill me. If if he was able to, yeah, you know, boxing is like after three minutes, everybody goes back to their corner. But this is a, this was a fight for my life. This is like a eat your face off kind of situation. There were clients that did that too. There was there was a client who would try to take bites out of you and swallow it so you couldn't have it back. All oh, right, you said that. Did they? Did he bite you? 
I didn't get bit. I had a buddy that got a whole bite of his shoulder taken out, though. Oh, my God. And what happened is he system, this patient was locked in his own special seclusion room. He could only come out for half an hour in the sunlight because he was so dangerous. He had to be harnessed on his ankles, his wrists, his uh, to his to his waist. Um, he had to have a spit mask over his face. So it's he, like Hannibal Lecter. They called him the Hannibal Lecter of the state hospital. So, so if you're looking for a job in mental health, <laughs> uh, yeah. apply at your local mental hospital. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, did you get support from the your superiors, your supervisors about this kind of stuff? No, the administration has no idea what they're doing. They're constantly under scrutiny. If you, I don't even have to break any kind of confidentiality. All you got to do is go to Google and type in like, you know, the the news stories that come out of places like the Arizona State Hospital. And you'll see one thing you'll see is there's a there was a riot on one of the units where two patients are just and they had coordinated it. There's a prison. What happened? Um, well, one guy owed the other, other guy money. The guy that attacked is sort of the kingpin of the unit. He's got a couple other guys under his under his wing. He can make them do stuff. And he put a hit. He put a hit out on this guy because he owed him money. And a riot happened. Yeah, um, a riot happened because it. it, it once that went down, other patients started to come to the situation and then it escalated and there was no staff because who the hell wants to work at a place like this except yeah. extremely good natured people or or gluttons for punishment with a fascination in psychology like me. Right. And you're rare because one, you you uh, studied boxing, but also you're bigger. I mean, what? You're like six one. Yeah. Yeah. Like. 210 or something yeah it's like you're probably one of the bigger staff members around you know oh, yeah. there's probably like petite girls working there as well yeah petite women i should say and so it's i just can't imagine you know in a prison for example every people you don't decide to work as a prison guard if you're not ready for a fight or if you're if you shy away from a fight you know what i mean right. but prisoners prison guards get things like stun guns and uh, mace and uh, you know defensive measures for themselves and they're not constantly short staff I actually don't know that I didn't work in that but I but I can tell you that so that particular guy they there was an order for five of us to be on him at once and like you said I'm a bigger guy and I can handle myself so you better believe Michael Dram was always on that patient every single day and <laughs> I got to know him real well and so part of it, but he was slowly systematically taking out all the other patients. He, he took a bite out of one. He punched this older lady. I mean, he was, you know, he's a bad dude. And so one day, and it happened quite a bit, but I'll just pick this one day where it was like, I showed up and we had our little meeting. I was like, okay, you're going to do this unit. You're going to do this. And Mike, you're going to, you've got, um, Hannibal Lecter, you know? And I'm like, okay. And then I'm kind of used to that. So I'm like, well, who's going to be with me? Well, we don't have a lot of staff. We'll call another unit and see if we can get some help for you. But uh, And I'd be like, well, if it's just me, I'm not going in there and, and suiting them up by myself. And then sometimes they'd kind of twist my arm into it. They'd be like, well, uh, doctor's orders is that he has to come outside for an hour to get sunlight. I mean, it's it's inhumane not to let him have that. And but I'm you like, have to suit him up in the whole Hannibal Lecter get up. Exactly. And so imagine, and so the way that's done is, as you're sitting down right now, Kirk, if I were to come suit you up, I would, I'd put your feet down by your side and I'd, I'd, I'd ankle them together. So you'd have to get him to go along with it. Yes. And, and if he doesn't go along with it, then... Well, he'll go along or he'll at least pretend to go along with it because he wants out desperately. So oh. he'll pretend to go out with it. But if he would get he was mildly uh, delayed and then he also had some schizophrenia. So and he was very impulsive. So he would get like a, uh, a command. And he was also very like uh, passively reactive. So if somebody pissed him off earlier in the day, he would wait for his opportunity. And he, you might not have even pissed him off. He might he just kind of got it in his head that you did something to him. So if I was suiting you up, I would be, I mean, to get down on your ankles and, and shackle your ankles, I have to get down beneath you. Ugh. And you're sitting in a chair with a penchant for biting people and, and swallowing it, right? Ugh. And and there's nobody else to help me. It's me. God. It's just me. Yeah. So there's there's all these moments of terror where I'm, I'm trying to strap him up and I'm keeping an eyes open in the back of my head. And how much are you getting paid at this $15 point? $15 an hour. <laughs> well, I guess that's not terrible, but that's not enough. No, it's not. So had, did you ever have any fl fluids flung at your face? 
Yeah, I had a whole colostomy bag thrown at me once. <laughs> <laughs> Did it burst? It's I ducked and it smacked against the wall and kind of exploded like an impact grenade. And so I ducked. It missed the, it missed the bag itself, but it splattered to the wall behind me, which was so close to me that it kind of got onto the back of me. Oh, so you got poo on your head. I did, and my scrubs. Oh, well, scrubs fine, but your head, my head, yeah, mm-hmm. your head. You got right. poo head, right? Poo head. Yep. Oh, yep. here poo, goes here poo, goes poo head. Poo grenade. <laughs> Were they angry at you for something? Uh, this guy was almost catatonic in the schizophrenia. He wouldn't say anything for days. Sometimes he'd just have one arm out and he would just it would sit there motionless. Oh. Um, but then, bam, out of nowhere, he would just impulsively attack, and you never knew when it was coming. And th- he wasn't verbal, so there was no talking about it. You know, it was like, oh shit, here he goes, and you know, like you have a doctor call an, uh, an order for a, a Thorazine shot and. You know, you try to take him down and restrain him. And with a colostomy bag, he has all these other medical issues. So if he rips it off, you know, he's still sort of leaking and stuff while you're trying to scramble him down to oh. to this bed. <laughs> you know, oh God. right. So it's it's incredible experience because I came out of there with a PhD in schizophrenia. Yeah, I'll say, you know, I mean, I really, really know my shit. And that's why with, with UPC, that's why I, it's steered in such a direction. So when we talk about serial killers and all, you know, cult leaders and all this stuff, I've kind of seen all that in my own personal, well, professional experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a women's riot once at a girl's unit. Uh, I got a code and I came down and there was, there was only four techs, but 20 something teenage girls and they were just swinging off the walls. And these four techs were trying to put, they put one girl down in a, in a like a therapeutic hole or restraint. And when they were doing that, five other girls would just start punching the tech in the back of the head and climbing on him until he released them. And so they'd take another one down. And, there, and it was just like whack-a-mole. And there was no actual reprieve from it. There was no getting away from it. You were just in this chaos where you're kind of like, you're you're in this hall and you're watching from all directions waiting for somebody to right. jump so, on the back of your neck. Right. So in a prison, they have protocols for this. Right. They have weapons or... A lockdown procedure. Right. Everyone runs out of the room and you just sort of let them sort of go for it and then, you know, pick up the pieces when you... Or get a hose out or something. Yeah. You'd have a riot teams roll through that hallway and tactically put everybody right. in their rooms. But But for you guys, it's like... You just have to brawl with right. each individual. It's it's crazy because you're, you're basically tasked. You're paid fifteen dollars an hour to brawl with other humans, you right? Know, under uh, and it's twenty to one or or twenty to five. You know, right? It doesn't seem very it's insane, fair. right? And there, and that's something we would always complain about because it's like we need more things to protect ourselves. We either yeah. need more staff. We need some kind of defensive and weapons. What? And it's not like these hospitals have shareholders that are rolling in dough right. like Donald Trump. This right. is not often a money-making scheme. No, you know? no, no. So no. what the problem is, is our society and politicians and voters do not allocate enough funds to this sort of thing. And so you don't have enough staff right. and you can't pay the staff enough. Right. And that's why we get the problem. It's because of us people. You can't blame the hospital. You blame us. All we need to do is elect officials, raise awareness, and have them spend just a tiny bit less on other kinds of things and a little bit more on mental health. And the Michael Drains at these hospitals would be paid 15 and a half an hour. You know, just, just <laughs> call it a, a poo bomb tax. Poo, poo, bomb, poo bomb exposure bomb. expense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, what's another, let's see, uh, spitting in your face. Anybody spit? Yep. Uh, what comes to mind is a, uh, he was between the age of nine and 12 little kid. I, I, I guess I have some sort of like psych hospital S and M or something. It's you're like, just, well, you're just really getting a lot out of this. Just It's like, it's like some kind of like, uh, psych hospital porn for everybody. Right. But yeah. So give me, give me this. All right. This spit all, right story. all right. So a uh, little kid age 10 to 12, he was adopted from, uh, one of the Ukrainian or Russian countries. I can't remember. 
Um, and with a lot of those adoptions, at least in my experience, they, they, those kids come over with a lot of inherent behavioral problems. And I've heard it suggested that that's why Russia is sending kids like that to the United States, because they are air quotes, problem kids. And so this kid had a lot of problems, very reactive, um, reactive attachment, uh, psychotic, um, hyperactive, he was like an sort of a hyperactive little kid that you can never control. And the things like, like most kids, but this kid was saying weird shit, like really weird stuff, very Mm. sexually inappropriate boundaries and Mm. talking about like, he'd talk about the day you're going to die and how it's going to happen. And then he would fixate on it and just do it for the whole, your whole shift. He would just be talking about how you're going to die. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The, The psychological wearing down over of, of that, you know, that kind of stuff takes its toll on you. Yeah. You know, you got to go home with that in your head. So anyway, during one of his, he, he was a little dude. It didn't take much to restrain him, but um, he was fearless. He didn't care at all. So during a code, we had to restrain him. Um, and the procedure is basically to hold him in place. He's in a, uh, they're either in a prone position where they're, they're laying on their stomach and they're, they're being, their hands are being held on their side. Or they're in a supine position where they're on their back, and it's kind of the opposite. Either way, it's meant to make them immobilized. Meanwhile, the nurse is getting doctor's orders for Thorazine or whatever kind of sedative, and bring it and get you know he'll get a shot. But in the meantime, while all this is happening, he's on his stomach and he's being held by me and maybe two other people. And as he's being held there and we're waiting for the nurse to show up, he's saying a bunch of really weird sort of triggering stuff. And you just kind of learn to block it out. Um, And when he figured out it wasn't working, that it's not going to affect us, he starts beating his face because he's on his he's he's laying on his stomach, remember, and his hands are restrained. All he can do is move his head, kick his feet, I guess. No, because somebody even had that. So he starts beating his face against the floor. Uh. Bam. Bam, 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 um, and laughing, cynically laughing like the Joker the entire time. And it, so we, I made this executive decision: like he, we can't let him beat his face against the wall. Turn him over. So we turn him on to his back, which was the stupidest idea ever, because now he has a mouthful of blood that, that he's bashed into his into, and so he just starts spitting it at all of us. Oh, bam, bam, bam. And, and you like, can't go because you have to keep hold of him. We have to keep holding him. So, and if we let him up, it's going to get a lot worse. We're going to lose control of the situation. So it's like, it's like, shit, shit, turn him back over again. You know what I mean? Like, so, so I had my forearm and I was just kind of letting him beat his face against my forearm and hoping he didn't figure out, hey, I'm going to take a bite out of that forearm, yeah. which didn't happen. Yeah. But there's things you can do. You can kind of have their head and push it to the side. And like you can there's ways to immobilize their head, too. But but we it, didn't it, have any PPE or we didn't have any protective gear at the time. Right. There was another tech getting us stuff. And I was like holding the kid with one hand while somebody's suiting me up in this prote- you know protective visor and the stu- this spit mask and the kid gets a spit mask and it's chaos yeah it's chaos yeah yeah i was going to say it's like why don't you have just some kind of like not a straight jacket but some kind of blanket you can put over around someone to sort of make it so they can't attack other people and maybe even protect their own head you're you're basically just using your own body as a as a cushion and stuff, it doesn't seem like there seems like there's a technical, you know. Well, and, and and hospitals train you to use your body as a shield against like if a, if a patient's banging their head against the wall, for example, you were trained to put your hand there. I just have to figure and block it. I just have to figure there's two factors. Then let me know what you think, because I find that to be highly problematic. You know that we put these uh, um, low paid individuals who are like yourself, who are wanting to make a difference, you know, you're interested in, in psychology and you're basically turned into these paid bodyguard thug, you know. But still a therapist somehow, yeah. still therapeutic in some way. But also kind of like, especially it's like, ooh, you know, Mike's big. It's like, right. he's great. Yeah, and give him all the hard patience. Yeah, because, you know, he's big and he, he can handle it. He can, he's physical, you know. Right. And it, it, it seems like one culturally that's just the way it's been done for so long because it's sort of an old profession it's an old model and two because of budget right it's like you 
you don't have enough money to go around to have facilities that can handle these sorts of things or to have enough uh, 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 staff or have enough equipment, you know, because I'm just guessing if you had two to three times the staff, there would be like half the problems. Oh, absolutely. We were constantly advocating for more staff, but it's like, you know, it's like screaming into the dark. You're just, you know. Well, you're asking people who don't have money what, you know, did it ever occur to you guys to actually like try to beckon the politicians and the, the, you know, population of Arizona to advocate for more money in mental health? Well, what, what kept happening is in that particular hospital is over the years, that hospital just got slammed one after another for lawsuits that are things that would happen. Um, like the, the kid that swallowed it, he broke a CD in half and swallowed it, cut up in his insides and died. The mom sues the hospital and all that could have been prevented if there would have been another staff, somebody else to watch him. That happened all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're caught con- and, and they were do. And it wasn't entirely that simple. Sometimes they would just make stupid logistical decisions. Like, mm-hmm. in addition to the techs who acted as bodyguards for sure, there was also a security staff. But the CEO at the time decided, no, and the security staff used to be part of the restraints and the and the, the codes and stuff. Well, the new CEO comes in and he goes, well, you know, I don't think it's really therapeutic for security guards with stun guns to be in the middle of this. And so new policy they're not going to be participating in holds it's just going to be the tax wow right you know, like how does that make I sense mean, i mean i understand if you get the logic but i, I mean I, I understand if it's like i don't want stun guns involved but the notion of we're not going to have a paid security staff that are trained and paid to actually deal with violence right. and we're going to put that on these 15 dollar an hour staff people who uh, presumably haven't been trained to deal with things on that level, you know what I mean? Or at least aren't paid enough to be dealing with things on that level. Uh, yeah, that seems pretty stupid. Yeah. But, but probably co- did it to save money, I'm guessing. Save money, I suppose. But I think I don't think they did save money in the long term because the mom sued, you know, the, right. the state after the, she lost her kid. There's been other uh, accounts where a nurse got her, I stabbed out with a highlighter in the hall when she was just trying to do her rounds. Her eye stabbed out. Gouge out. Out. Yeah. You like know, no more eye. Mm-hmm. Like one of those thin. Well, actually, I don't know. She kept the eye. I don't know that part, but this, this is a secondhand story. I wasn't working on that unit, but everybody was talking about what happened. But yeah, she was going down the hall and one of the more problematic clients just had found a highlighter. One of the skinny ones, not one of the big fat ones, somehow got one of those Put her on the ground. She was an older lady. Scooped her eye out. Oh, yeah. And she lost her eye. I assume so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, God. There was another guy. And some of those people, they're so scary. They're so huge and massive. And you're under, you're understaffed. And Right. So think Mindhunter, right? So <laughs> you, you have guys like that, right? In what way? Like, I mean, in Mindhunter, there was that first guy that that main I've, he's a real guy that uh you've seen mine hunter the TV no. show? oh um well i don't know why i'm asking you then but it's a show about the 70s i think and there are serial killers and some of them are incarcerated and these fbi agents go to these facilities to actually some and some of them are in mental institutions well i don't know i'm kind of talking out of my butt now because maybe they're just in regular prison anyway um, the point is, is that some of these, some of these people are very scary individuals who have murdered or been very violent or with no intent to stop. Right, and they are, they can also be large, <laughs> mm-hmm. and devious, and um, are intent. That's that's just the thing that I think a lot of people who don't work in your job don't understand, which is that you know it's relatively rare, but there are individuals who for whatever reason, you know, call it trauma, call it mental illness, call it just their own personal choice, they have decided that, they consistently decide that it's their, they love or they're just going to do things that are going to harm other people and they're, they're going to find a way. Well, and, and normally what, what happens, um, yes, you have that from just a pure sadistic antisocial personality sort of lens. Um, what mostly happens in my experience is that they'll, there will be a, 
a command hallucination there, a voice in your head saying that these people are bad guys. You need to do something. That person stole from you. That person doesn't like you or that person doesn't, that person's going to hurt you tonight. They're going to poison you tonight. You need to do something about it. You know, that kind of just constant voice. Have you seen that new movie with Claire Foy where it just came out like a few months ago where she gets, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but she gets, um, so so the whole thing is like, she's just a regular businesswoman and she goes to this town and she goes to therapy and the therapist deems her or mistakenly thinks she wants to be institutionalized and puts her into this involuntary facility hmm. and gets a 72 hour order to involuntarily, you know, detain her. It's weird because that's that would be extremely hard to have that miscommunication. Right. Well, so you haven't seen it, but I'd be curious what you thought about it. Um, and it's sort of a mystery because on some level, there are times when you're thinking, oh my God, this hospital is crazy. Yeah. And there's this conspiracy against her to make money because they just need patients. And then other times you're thinking, oh, well, maybe she does have an issue and maybe she is legitimately being uh, hospitalized. And then it, it all kind of works its way to the end. And then eventually you, you learn the story. But it's made by Steve Soderbergh, you know, Soderbergh. He, he made the Ocean's Eleven movies. Oh, yeah. And, I love those movies. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay. It might be interesting to note that that I have personally felt that way too. Where and that's not just a, it could be the pa- the patient sort of getting to you or your own experiences getting to you. But I have had the thought of like, is this just a money factory or or is anybody really being helped here? What do you mean? Um, like very much like our American prison systems. You know, it's a privatized institution that's that that gets more money the more people that are in it and some of these hospitals like the state hospital it's not a private hospital but you certainly have them um you have personal vendettas of maybe a patient has rubbed a psychologist or something the wrong way as much as i want to say that all everybody in our field is professional you know i there i know a story about a social worker that climbed into bed with one of her patients and she would sleep in the bed with her every night i know a story about a psychologist that made that when I was in session with my client, my patient, that psychologist who was also the pay, the, uh, that was also her patient, came into the middle of my session and started sort of grilling my patient about why haven't you been taking your meds? We need to talk about a med change. I heard you popped off last week and really, really escalated him. And I was just kind of sitting there, A, super irritated that he just she just walked into the middle of my session. But, you know, there's kind of a hierarchy there with her being a psychologist and me being an intern and um, I, and I was just completely caught off guard, but she triggered him to the point where by the end of it, he's, she's like, you know, I'm gonna have to court order you and blah, blah, blah. And the conversation could be handled a thousand different ways that were better. But instead she triggers this kid. He's throwing chairs. He walks out into the day room. He's, he's completely escalated. They have to put him in a code. They right. have to go in a restraint. So you rinse and repeat that process. And not only is that just, problematic in the moment, but it creates this tremendous amount of animosity on the behalf of the patient towards the staff. Yeah, that, mistrust. Yeah, that leads to misbehavior. Mm-hmm. And then the cycle just continues. Whereas if everyone just calmed down, you could get them to a place where some recovery could happen and they could be released. Right. Um, interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so did you see things along those lines in terms of systems or individuals that it's like they were almost working against the patient's abilities to recover and be released? It did sort of feel that way at times. Like I said, the psychologist that clearly didn't have her patient's best interests at heart to, to interrupt his own therapy session and then to engage him in a very threatening manner that was only going to piss him off, that kind of professionalism. But um, it was a little bit like Shawshank Redemption, you know, when, when Morgan Freeman goes for his parole every 10 years or whatever, and they just kind of deny him, deny him, deny him. And um, even though he's reformed, and even early on in the movie, he he's he, you get the sense that he's not going to go out and kill somebody. He's already learned his lesson, but just because of the red tape and the complacency and the prejudgment that you are a patient that did something wrong and like you have why would i let you out into the hospital you know you got to give me a damn good reason to let you out into the into the world 
because it is kind of on their ass if, and it's happened where they let a client go and the client goes and kills somebody in a psychotic episode because they also have all this comor- comorbidity with substance abuse issues. So they go out, they do some meth, activates their psychosis, and then they do something stupid. Then they come down and bam, right back where they started. So are you ever going to work in that environment again? Oh, God, no. Uh-uh. <laughs> nope, I'm done. <laughs> I am private practice all the way, man. That's why I moved up here is to is to like wean my way out of all that, the red tape of the, the hospitals and the bureauc- bureaucracy of it all. And um, no, I'm done. I've done my time. So to help the listeners who are at sort of the beginning stages of their career development, yeah. if you could go back, would you do it all the same? <sighs> He thinks. He thinks. He, he, pon- pauses. he ponders. <laughs> um, I don't think I would have stayed as long. Okay. I had it in my head way before I even got my bachelor's that I need to start getting work experience now, right now, before I even get into school because it's because getting into my bachelor's, I'm going to have to prove I have some experience and then getting into my master's, I'm going to have to really prove. And so I really sort of went over the top. I made it my full time job all throughout my bachelor's and my master's and never really stopped. And so um, it probably wasn't necessary to do that because I interesting met, because I met a bunch of clinicians later on that have a bachelor's in something completely different. Yeah. My bachelor's is in business. When I started uh, my master's, uh, and most, I mean, take it from me, a program director, past program director, and someone who interviews people all the time, I would say about 75% of our applicants have absolutely no experience yeah. or very little anyway. Right. And that's fine. You know, it's like, it's not a requirement. I guess it, and even, and people with experience, it's actually, it's kind of bad because in a related fields, you know, because other fields have completely different paradigms that they propagandize you to believe you know someone who works for cps for example someone who works as a teacher for example i have it's so much harder for me as an as a trainer and supervisor to deprogram a teacher because as a teacher you have a totally different mindset naturally and as a cps worker a social worker you have a completely different mindset and a therapist mindset is a very unique mindset (laughs) and so um, and actually, you're probably going to run into it yourself if you haven't already to some extent. I don't know. I, I, we haven't talked shop like that. But let me t- let me tell you a, a like a a story that I th- of you. <laughs> let me oh. tell you your story. All and, right. and you tell me if it's wrong or right. Okay. So so you're uh, you know you're getting you're you're going to college and you're like I want to work in mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to be a therapist. Mm-hmm. I want to be a counselor. Okay. And you're like, okay, and you just told me, but I just want to tell this this story because I want to demonstrate actually for because we a lot of people listen to this podcast are like at the, those very early stages of like and they'll email me they'll be like, what should I do? In fact, I think someone just emailed me today. This is like, okay, so I want to, um, I'm in, I'm 20 years old. How can I sort of set myself up? And and the long story short is that just get a bachelor's degree in right. in anything right. Just get, and, and honestly, if if you want to be a therapist, I guess even if you want to go into clinical psychology, I mean, if you want to go into high-minded research at the most competitive universities in the United States, which I have to say isn't a very fun job, I'm here to tell you. Um, but, you know, it's people who love that kind of super academic, um, you know, dog-eat-dog world. Yeah then yeah, your bachelor's degree might kind of matter. But for 99.99999% of jobs in psychology and in counseling and therapy, you don't need that. So, you, you, so just get any degree. In fact, take it easy on yourself and get the easiest bachelor's degree you could possibly get. <laughs> I have reviewed hundreds of applicants, thousands of applicants probably, and I tell you, like, I don't look at where they come from. I mean, occasionally I'm like, oh, Purdue or, or, oh, University of Washington where I went or, you know, oh, Harvard or something like, but most of the time it's like some, some college I don't know about or even community college or something. And it's just like, I just look at the grades and I look at the GPA and then I move on because really what I'm interested in is the essay and like when I meet the person, what they kind of come across to me as. And that's more of an Antioch philosophy too. But I, but I find that other universities have at least in that direction, you know, much less because you're sort of programmed 
a lot of high school students today are programmed to believe that you have to go to the right school, mm-hmm. you have to have the right activities, you have to have the right resume, you have to get the best grades, you have to have the the most interesting volunteer work and all this kind of stuff. And if you want to do that, great. But I'm here to tell you, like, uh, there's a lot of jobs. In fact, I would guess most jobs don't care. Now, if you want to volunteer and you want to go to a nice college and you want to, you know, have a good GPA, yeah, go for it. But I'm here to tell you, like, the the way the real world operates, like, it, it's so much more important to demonstrate that you're a well-rounded, interesting person who can think. And there's a lot of roads to that. And and going to Harvard and getting 4.0 is not, necess- believe me, necessarily the road to that. Anyway, it can be. Anyway, so so you're like, okay, I want to get a job in it. And a very entry level job is like these these kinds of uh, these kinds of facility jobs that are extremely hard to fill because yeah. of obvious reasons. Right. And you're like, okay, I'll go to you know, I'll do this, I'll do this job. And you're and you're thinking, ooh, I'm you know, I'm 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 differentiating myself. I'm I'm helping out, okay. Right. And then you sort of work your way up, and you're working hard, and then you're okay. Eventually, finish your bachelor's, okay. Eventually, go to a master's program, and then while you're in your master's program, you have a shit ton of self esteem about working in a hospital. I mean, you're are you're a master tech at a hospital, and then when your internship comes around, you're like, well, I could be a counselor at some local agency and feel like a piece of shit because I, like every other intern, I feel worthless as a counselor. Yeah, right. Or I can work, I can just sort of sidestep to another office in my hospital and right. be an intern counselor, be a full counselor, sure. you know, an intern counselor. But I'm in a facility, I understand working with patients, I understand working in a system, I understand. Right. But you, correct me if I'm wrong, you sort of disbenefit from that because you're still a counselor at a hospital, which is really quite different from being a counselor in, in, a, in really any other environment. Absolutely. It's all about how you, how you look at it, whether it's a benefit or not. Like, for example, I remember whenever I would do group supervision. So group supervision, for those who don't know, new student therapists will sit in a class with other new student therapists and they'll have a teacher and they will discuss their cases. They'll present their cases. And well, everybody in my class was in like marriage and family clinics and, you know, kind of uh, more garden variety, I guess. Easy, I don't, I, easy. I don't mean to be insulting. I know that's, no, no. that's, that's way great easier than right. uh, serial killers and, <laughs> and poo bombs. <laughs> right. Um, so, so they had no help to offer me, not even the professor, no. you know, just deer in the headlights. Like, well, uh, well have you tried talking with them about it? <laughs> yeah. You know, like yeah. no, I, no idea. So I never got a lot of help or a lot of feedback. Well, and that's also probably a function of the supervisor you had at the time. Too. Right. Right. Um, but, um, so you have a shit ton of self-esteem in a hospital. Yes. You do your internship at a hospital, um, because that's a natural choice. And I've seen a lot of people do that. Yeah. Um, like I had the devil, s- you know, right. I had someone who worked in chemical dependency for 20 years. That, so that's another field that I have to work really hard to deprogram someone because chemical dependency beats a certain thing into your head, which is fine for chemical dependency, but it's t- some of it is completely antithetical to being good, to being a good therapist. And sure. so as I'm working with her, uh, so, and then she became an intern, but she, became an intern with what she knew, which was in a ke- chemical dependency place that she actually worked at. Right. So so everyone kind of still treated her as a chemical dependency person anyway. And so, um, so a lot of people do that. And then you do that, and then you graduate, but you still pretty much only have skills in working in hospitals. Well, with a very specific population. Right. And so it's like, well, yeah. might as well continue to do that, you know, Getting my hours, getting licensed, getting paid mo- much more than I was before when I right. was just a tech, you right. know. Um, and you know, nine years later, you're like, "How did I get here?" Yeah, completely burned out because you that I was burned out working with that population all those years. Uh, you know, you see some shit, and it, right. it just it takes little bites out of you. Yeah, I mean, we're making jokes, but like the the thing the things you go through are traumatic. You know, you, yeah. you're shaking. You're you're physically traumatized. You're going home. You need to have a six pack just to go to sleep. Right. I've, I, rem- I remember sometimes just sitting on my bed when I got home and just my hands shaking. Yeah. I remember one time there was a little 12 year old kid 
who had a pencil to his throat and he was going to stab himself. Oh. And I spent the enti- what felt like the hours, the entire shift, trying to talk this kid out from doing it. And everybody else was just like complacent, like ready to tackle him to the ground. And I was like, like, what if he does it while you're trying to tackle him? Like, just chill. And so I'm talking with him and I'm talking with him. And when I got home that night, I was so emotionally exhausted that I, I remember just kind of collapsing onto the bed. Yeah. I had nothing left. Right. So, um, so let me tell a different story. Okay. You, uh, don't do that job. You just do some other job, like, I don't know, a waiter or something. Yeah. Um, do they have waiters in Arizona? Sure. I don't know. Yeah. I've, I haven't really been there very much. Um, yeah, they make two thirteen an hour, unlike <laughs> unlike up here. But yeah, not two thirteen. You're joking. No, I'm not. I think it. I, I think it went. It might have gone up. But when I was a server, it, I made two thirteen an hour plus tips or something. Plus is that, tips. Is that the idea? Like yeah, plus tips. But if you don't get tips or it's a slow day, you just made two thirteen an hour. Oh my you know god. I mean? Yeah. So. Um, just so everyone knows, socialist Seattle, you get everyone yeah. gets fifteen an hour. Like it's the minimum wage in Seattle, fifteen. Right. Even the servers. Yeah, even the servers. So um and when they passed that law five years ago, all the Republicans were uh, predicting that would be the end of our economy, and it couldn't have been the opposite. <laughs> our economy <laughs> is fucking booming. When we had the the crisis in oh eight, um, we were one of the only cities in the Western world that actually like had just kind of a dip. Do you know what I mean? Wow. It, yeah. I mean, you know, you have Microsoft, Amazon. Yeah, it's all here. Uh, who owns Whole Foods now, right? Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is, isn't is headquartered here, but lots of offices. You have lots of Google offices. Um, all the Xbox, several Xbox teams uh Boeing is a massive economy thing that often gets ignored because it's not sexy like Google or right, something. Right. Um Adobe, who am I leaving out? I know I'm leaving some people out. Other, you know, Bungie, you know, fair anyway. The point is is that um uh socialism works. Anyway, <laughs> um so the <laughs> So the um uh the other story is you just get to work you, you work at a, as a waiter for 213 an hour. And you go faster through college and mm-hmm. you go to master's right away. You feel really out of your element, oh, much, yeah. much more than you would have otherwise because you're like, you don't even know what schizophrenia is, right. you know, for example. Right. But, you know, you're, you feel similar as everyone else. You get an internship at a regular agency. You graduate. Maybe you work in a hospital. Maybe you don't. But, you know, you uh, don't ever have to have a poo bomb. You don't ever have to have... <laughs> Uh, the shakes when you get home, or at least a lot less frequently. And, you know, you lose the enjoyment or the professional satisfaction of having worked in a hospital and all the experiences you've had and how much of an expert you are with that population, which is something that... It's very rare. Right. I don't know a lot of people. Most therapists have no contact with. Yeah. Right. So I'm sort of a cornered market, which has really worked out for the podcast. Yeah. You know. Oh, okay. You know, I, I've, I took what I knew and turned it into UPC, right. you know, and I kind of stay in that wheelhouse where it's just like psychology in Seattle is more about um, what you know, you know, the general theory and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the biggest difference between our two shows. Well, and then I have guests like you come on and just, you know, I can just scalp your information. <laughs> um, have you ever done an episode about the hospital work that you did? Like just purely about that? Justin and I, a long time ago, we did an episode about uh, just the evolution of mental hospitals and the kind of treatments that used to be done in mental hospitals. That's really fascinating. I might yeah. do a, I might redo another one on those, the way they used to be called lunatic asylums. And, the, and even before they had those lunatic asylums, the, the people that were mentally ill, it was incumbent on the family to take care of them with whatever resources. I mean, can you imagine taking care of your schizophrenic kid in 1880 in the middle of your farmhouse and God knows where? Yeah. What are you going to do? So a lot of times they wind up winding the room in the streets and just being homeless vagabonds. Right. But at the same time, the little bit I understand of like what lifestyle would have been like back then is say you're developmentally disabled or schizophrenic and you're on a farm basically in the wilderness. Yeah. And so the the chance of you and, and the amount of human beings around you are much fewer. You can't get on a bus and go somewhere. So 
you have to walk, and everyone within walking distance of your farmhouse knows you and knows how to deal with you. Probably. And so the you know the the consequences are just so much lower because in today's world, if you are suffering a psychotic break, you can walk out your door and within five seconds you could be running into people who don't even know who you are. Sure. And they don't know how to react to you. You know, they're just sure. like, "What's happening?" So um, I, I, that's what I surmise. Well, the counter know? the counter to that, although you're not wrong, but the count the uh, the counter to that is that. This person lives in a farmhouse. It's 1880. The medical and just the understanding of what schizophrenia is is non-existent. And yeah, they're probably bleeding and leeching you. Yeah, they're, they're, they're yeah bleeding you out and um, you know trepidation where they would like do like water treatments or drill a hole in your head and all kinds of crazy shit. Right. Um, so maybe you'd have some town doctor come drill a hole in your head and like bleed you out for a while and see if that helps. But if the nature, the presentation of their schizophrenia is such that it's highly dangerous to other people, if it's very paranoid, for example, that paranoia just fuels uh, command hallucinations, all it takes is a voice to be like, you know, I think Kirk is trying to kill me right now, you know, and now I'm guarded. Now I think I want to kill him. And then over over time, this sort of, and then if you live in this house with you and Ma and Pa and maybe some siblings and stuff, and you have these interactions and you have you have all this confirmation bias that's you see like, oh, why did you serve my cereal last? Is it because it's poisoned? You know, and so you, although you don't have all the people of the modern day world to trigger you, what you do have is this fishbowl population with no real immediate support if you decide to murder your entire family. Who's going to even know about it? God. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm getting the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that does it for that creepy episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for talking about all that, Michael. Drink. Yeah, that was fun, man. If you're interested in hearing more about this sort of stuff, subscribe to the Unpopular Culture podcast on iTunes and otherwise. You can go to upc.org. Uh, upcpodcast.com. UPC podcast. UPC pod, Unpopular Culture pod. UPC cod, pod, not UPC cod past no that is not the one don't confuse our listeners <laughs> upc podcast and then uh our handle is at upc podcast twitter facebook and instagram and then our patreon page where we have bonus episodes is patreon.com slash upc podcast and thank you for joining me everybody and michael for this interesting talk and please take care of yourself because you deserve it you, sh you sure do. You sure do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs>